Hello, Ben. Today Hello, we're welcome down to Sunny City. Well, thank you for it having is, me. You know, Hi, I'm Paul Rushworth Brown, host of History Bards and Down Under Interviews, and I'm here with a very interesting author, John B. Wren, who has written a very interesting novel, And Should I? Welcome to the show, John. Thank you for having me. Now, I, I must admit, um, the uh, after doing my research on on your novel, a lot of the Gaelic wor words, obviously the novel set in, I in Ireland back in the 10th century, but a lot of the Gaelic words scare me. I mean, I'm Australian, okay? I have difficulty pronouncing English words. I don't know about Irish words, <laughs> but- I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> so what? tell me about, um, you know, how did you, I mean, you're, you're an ex-engineer. How did you get into this? My, my mother was born in Ireland and okay. growing up, she came over on the boat when she was about five years old and her and her sisters, uh, whenever I would uh, be with them, would frequently would frequently tell stories about Ireland and, and the good old days and how, how bad the English were and, and how great Ireland was. And they were glad to be in America. Anyway, um, so there was all that in my background. And then uh, uh, as, as, I would, as I would read different books or see different movies, I was intrigued by things from the Middle Ages. I don't know why it, it did, but it, it just intrigued me. Um, when I became aware of a, a certain battle in Ireland, just north of Dublin in a place called Clontarf, uh, it's the, it, it, it occurred in the year 1014. And after that battle, the king, the high king of Ireland was killed. His name was Brian Baru. In intro die, the warrior's legacy the second thrilling installment of John B. Wren's historical fiction trilogy, The Turbulent World of 10th Century Ireland Comes Alive. Sons of Day Mac Lorcaine grapple with their destinies. Set against the real backdrop of battles for thrones and power, the story follows Garpan, Lafer, and Tanai, three brothers whose lives are shaped by prophecy, war, and family duty. As one rises to fight alongside Brian Boru, Destined to become High King of Ireland, their fates intertwine with historical figures and the fierce Del G. Case clan. This epic saga blends action, betrayal, and loyalty, as Ireland's future hangs in the balance. There was a character who appears in history and in myth several times whose uh, name is given as Wolf the Quarrelsome. Wolf was the inspiration for my writing about a character, a, a warrior who fought for Brian Baru, um, and I call him Kanal. So uh, I, I had to make him in some way special, but not claim to be Wolf the Quarrelsome. I leave that for people if they want to decide that's who he was, fine. Uh, so anyway, um, I had to give some backstory to it, and I went all the way back several generations to a Viking warrior in a, in a raid on a village in Connaught when he, he rapes a young girl and uh, she winds up having a son. My next question, um, I did some research and uh, apparently Irish book buyers have backed homegrown talent in 2024 with 13 of the top 20 bestsellers being Irish born. So 2024 is still shaping up to be one of the, the strongest years in history for Irish-type books. Why is that? I really don't know. But uh, I, would, I would hope that people find, things, find the same things interesting that I did. And that may have inspired them to delve into those books. Bard's Sing of Love and War is a captivating historical novel set in 11th century Wales, where love, honor, and ambition clash amidst the Norman invasion. As Chief Bard Rodri mentors young Tal, the tale unfolds with political intrigue, familial loyalty, and forbidden romance, centering on Griffith Rees's quest to reclaim his kingdom and win Gwenlian's heart. Amidst King Henry I's campaigns, 
and betrayals within King Gruffid Sinan's court, a web of deception, secret marriages, and daring rescues promises to enchant fans of epic romance and adventure. In one of four, Travis Davis takes you on an unforgettable journey from the battle-scarred trenches of World War I to the solemn grounds of Arlington National Cemetery. Through the eyes of an unknown soldier, discovered by a young French girl and immortalized in his 100-year-old diary, this novel intertwines the harrowing experiences of the Western Front with a modern-day story of a father and son, estranged yet brought together by the soldier's legacy. As they retrace the soldier's final days, this poignant narrative reveals the unspeakable horrors of war, the enduring bonds of family, and the timeless pursuit of honor. One of Four is a compelling exploration of courage, sacrifice, and the healing power of remembrance. Inspired you to explore this specific time. It, it started with that Battle of Clontarf and it being the 1,000 year anniversary in 2014. And that led me to, it, it just kind of grew from there to all these different things that happened. So that I, I, I list uh, several different battles in, in, in the book. Battle back then was face to face with a sword or an ax or a pike. And you try to, you, you sit back and imagine that kind of thing. Think about it and, and, that's what I did. I gave it serious thought. And it's really kind of scary to think about facing somebody five feet away or three feet away and then swing a sword at him and lop his head off or something like that. But that's what battle was. It was bloody. It was messy. It was terrible. And I tried to write write that kind of thought into what I wrote. You must have an amazing imagination. Well, I can lie about anything. <laughs> I have told people that I get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, come down to my computer and start telling lies. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, so tell me about the three brothers. Oh, at, at one point, there are three brothers. There's uh, uh, Larie, uh, Garban, and Tanai. That's the one you're talking about. Yeah. Um, they are the, the sons of a, of a, uh, a man named Dai. Uh, Garban is a braggart. He says he's going to uh, do wonderful things, and he tells his grandmother he's going to kill a hundred people in battle. But anyway, he's uh, he he doesn't train well. He does not try. He doesn't work at his craft of being a a warrior, and he uh, runs off when he's too young. Joins a um, an army led by Kennedy, and uh, um, he winds up turning his back and running away and being killed. His brother, Lurie, uh turns out to be a true warrior. He's large. He's, he's, uh, he trains well. He works very hard at his craft. And the third brother, Tanai, uh, is not really a warrior. He's a farmer. And he, he helps the, 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 the cause by doing he's, – he's providing food, and he feels like he's contributing. And he, he is. He's a very good man. These three brothers, they uh, – I mean <laughs> – how did you build their sort of like character? I kind of, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of thought about different people I have known in my life and what, what kind of um, high points each one of them had, and what kind of low points each one of them had. And I had to give the three brothers something totally different. So they, they were not like uh, twins or triplets or whatever. Each one had their own character. So I had the, uh, the first one, Garban, being the coward. The second one, Larie, being the hero, and the third one, Tanai, being well, he 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 likes to grow plants, he likes to grow food. Um, so they were totally different, and and each one had had a a place in the story. It must have taken a lot of a hell of a lot of research to do this. But what was the hardest part of writing the book? It seems that uh, with uh, several different sources providing information about the various characters, real characters. Uh, the stories are not always the same. They vary from one source to another. But I, I tried to follow a stream of thought that that worked for, uh, that, that uh, could be accurate and, and did not violate history. Discover the extraordinary life of George Matcham, 
the man who dared to cross continents in an era of exploration and intrigue. Born in Bombay under the East India Company's watchful eye, George embarked on three monumental overland journeys between Asia and England. His adventures set the stage for a remarkable story, culminating in his marriage to the beloved sister of the future Lord Admiral Nelson. Through his intimate connections with Nelson and the enchanting Emma Hamilton, George's life is vividly brought to life with authentic period press clippings and eyewitness accounts. Dive into a most unsettled man for an unprecedented glimpse into the private life of an 18th century English gentleman, while experiencing the enduring love story of Nelson and Emma from a fresh and captivating perspective. Tell me, we, you know, uh, you've you've mentioned the uh, the rape scene. Was that a difficult uh, a difficult part of the book to write? Uh, yeah, I have I have five sisters. Yeah, um, I have a daughter. I have two granddaughters, and yeah. when you think about all that, and you write a scene like that, you know, it's it's difficult. Was there any sort of like uh, chapter or, or or chunks of the novel that you took it took out of the book? You know. Um, prior to the final edit, they thought, oh, no, I'll take that out, take that out. It's not needed or didn't like. That's a good question. <laughs> and I'm trying to think back to uh, when I, when I, when I took the three, I, I had, I had written Canal first, Larry second and Scully third. And then when I took them all down and combined them into one book on Tradai period, um, it was kind of tough to do the transition from one to the other. And uh, I had several different versions of each transition. And I, you know, I threw away two or three of them and kept the one that I thought worked the best. Some of, some of my novels have uh, been, you know, copped a bit of flack because uh, people have said that, that, that they're too descriptive. Um, and my argument always was that, you know, I, I like my readers to sort of like be in the place and in the time. And so for that reason, you need to be a little bit descriptive to, to, to basically describe the world around them and around the characters. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my, my first two, the, the two novellas, one of the, a, a common thread from several different reviewers or people who read the books was that it was too brief, not sufficiently descriptive of medieval times. And my response to that is what I tried to convey was not necessarily the conditions of life in medieval times. It was the development of that character uh, from, from birth to death. And if I, if I did not need to say, um, if I did not need to be very descriptive about the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the places where the, the round houses that they built or the thatched roofs and, and uh, the stretching racks and all that kind of stuff that they would have in their little settlement. If I didn't need to do that to make the story complete, I wouldn't put it in. Some people didn't like that. Other people would say you were too descriptive in, in uh, battle scenes where heads were lopped off and arms were chopped up. In the charming but secretive town of Wallingford Heights, 1893, three hairdressers and a sempstress are more than just masters of style, they're amateur sleuths. When a chilling triple murder rocks their sleepy Massachusetts town and a young suffragist is wrongfully accused, these four spirited women from the Vine Salon, one of America's first, must unravel a web of dark secrets. Using their keen ears for gossip and sharp minds, Estelle, Chastity, Mary Lou, and Clara dive into a thrilling mystery that intertwines the dangers of the past with the promise of a changing future. Darlene Adams is a free-spirited woman who is beautiful, can shoot, and she doesn't break a promise. Ruthlessly ditched after being in a relationship for 20 years, Darlene takes work on a remote cattle property. Two years later, she's out of work but retains the Queensland title of Pistol Champion. 
Now her eyes are on the national titles held in Western Australia. En route, she learns about her missing niece and takes things into her own hands. I mean, were there any discoveries through your research that you um, that you were shocked with? Well, as it turns out, the uh, the sides were comprised of Vikings on both sides, Irish on both sides, Norse on both sides. It, it was a, a, a each leader, like Brian Baru or um, one of his opponents, um, they would form an army based on people that they could gather together. And in Ireland back at that time, uh, tribes and, and clans would fight with each other with great regularity. On one day, they're fighting against each other. The next day, they're fighting on the same side. So that was kind of a surprise to me. Okay, so that's where you're going, right? You're going into the next century. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Irish history, and I find different places, like the, the Battle of Clontarf was the inspiration for the first set and the uh, the Norman invasion in, in 1169, 70, 71. That's the inspiration for what I'm working on now. I mean, I've already said that um, Irish writers are, are extremely popular in, in 2024. Um, who, who's going to read this novel? God, I hope everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the more the merrier. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would hope that, that somebody might find Irish history sufficiently interesting to make them want to read it. I would hope that people who enjoy uh, books about battles and things of that in general would enjoy reading it. I would hope that uh, uh, people who like the, the way I have developed the, uh, the several characters, I hope they would read and enjoy. It sounds like uh, a book for men who don't read. Would you, would you agree with that? I, I, was, I was such an animal years ago. I was an engineer. And um, I went through a divorce and I was living by myself and I needed something to something inexpensive to occupy my time. And somebody said, read a book. How is it rewarding for you? It uh, <clears throat> certainly not financially. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I get out of it is being able to put something down in writing and have people read it and say, I enjoyed that. John, it's been wonderful to meet you. And thank you so much for being on the show. And um, Andrew Doy, good luck with that. And, thank you, thank you. And an Irish, an Irish story. So it should be very, very popular in 2024. I hope it is. And yeah. I hope to continue. Yeah. So thanks very much for being on the show. Thank you.